we were playing in today's world, we would be going to the, the Olympics. I mean, we were that good. As a team, they were absolutely, without question, a serious factor in ladies softball. Not only in, Al in Calgary and Alberta, they, they went to the Nationals. They were a great team. Sport is often seen as a masculine domain. How is it possible to overcome some of the discrimination that we experienced? What drew them to the sport in the first place? It wasn't a job or a livelihood. They loved the game, and that's probably the way they played it in those days, was for the love of the sport. Softball's one of the early team sports that women played. We see some evidence before the First World War, but it really becomes popular in the 20s and 30s. From the 1940s teams, the All-American Girls Baseball League, the girls were trained. They had to take etiquette lessons. They were not even allowed to wear slacks outside of the ballpark. So if you did, you were kicked off the team and fined as well. We've had this issue in women's sport where if you are going to be a good athlete, then somehow means that you're masculine in some way. Was in that got transferred into one sexuality. And so you began to see athlete, lesbian. This, of course, is really quite nonsensical because there are probably equal number of lesbians in sport as there are in the rest of society. It affects not just the individuals in sport who are gay, but it's affects the people in women's sport who are not gay. How did they deal with those particular issues? Until we understand this particular role that sport plays for women in society, we don't have a full picture of all of their accomplishments and all of the roles that they play. When you get to the 50s and the post-war period, because you have a society that's attempting to become more normal after a, a long period, where gender roles were in some ways reversed, uh, men went to war, women had to take over many of the roles in society, and that occurred in sport also. And uh, the sport was affected by the war. Women actually entertained the troops and uh, thousands of people would come and watch uh, women's softball in that period of time. When I first started umpiring in 66, softball for the ladies just was on its ascendancy. One of the reasons that Calgary could have had a number of good teams, I always think sports here in Alberta depends where you grew up and where you're living. And Calgary with the Chinooks and all that, spring could come a lot earlier than maybe up in Edmonton or Red Deer. And Calgary had really good women's softball, really good. They had the Comets who eventually won three Canadian championships. That's all with local homegrown talent. I started playing in 1965. We started in January. We'd start indoors getting into shape. Uh, probably around end of April, beginning of May, we'd have the outdoor practices where we would uh, have tryouts for the team, double headers, and then weekends, just about every weekend of my summer was taken up in a ball tournament somewhere in Canada. They were very serious and very good ball players. You know, you couldn't even blink when you weren't supposed to. When we had tournaments in town, it was, the stands were full. I mean, there was just, it was just good ball. The men's teams were very, very good too, but I think the women's were more entertaining because the pitching on the men's side was pretty overpowering. I mean, they could throw the ball so hard and that. I mean, their games were one nothing, whereas our games, they could, they could, uh, we could get some hits together and make it exciting, I guess, so. Back in those days, I think, you know, they called it softball, but it was fastball. It was not like the slow pitch that you get today. It was, it was almost like the men. But if you've got girls throwing the ball in, in the 90s and they're throwing it from that much closer, that batter's got to react pretty quick is just as fast as those baseball players. I, I don't mind telling you, I was intimidated. I couldn't let them know at the time that, I, that they intimidated the heck out of me. But yeah, I was. You had to be tough or you wouldn't survive if you were to make a mark in the sport. That's how, how it was in those days. And you know, they practiced just like, just like the men. If they weren't playing, they're practicing.
throughout the history of women's sport, women have had to fight, they've had to struggle to make sure that their sport was recognized and their achievements were recognized in the same way as men. I think the women on the team were quite a variety of where they came from in life and the jobs that they were doing. I mean, we had people that were working in offices and people that were doing landscaping. It was a little bit of everything. Do they have to worry about preparing dinner? Do they have to worry about cleaning the house to, uh, before they can come to the ball game? I don't know because a lot of them were probably working mothers. We were all working girls, so uh, working uh, all my life and had to go to work every day and, and uh, a house to keep and a yard to keep and a dog to make happy. And, <laughs> and we were just amateurs. We, we gave up our time to, to learn the sport and play it well and that. I had three young kids and my mom was, thank goodness, was there to, to watch them for me. The kids came to the games in bundles sometimes as Moms and daughters and sisters, they, they were always involved. My husband was supposed to be out watching the kids, and that, that game I was playing center field, and I look up and I notice my youngest daughter is at the top of the backstop. And I'm trying to signal to my husband to, that's our kid up there. Would you go get her, <laughs> get her down? And finally, uh, the ump stopped the game, and my kid crawled, <laughs> got down, and yeah and it was just a big embarrassment for me. It opened my eyes to what's across Canada, which when, you know, I got married very young, so I have three young kids and that, so I, I would not have been able to travel. You really got to know the people that you were playing with and traveling with. A lot of laughter, because they used, to, Betty Hodson and I traveled quite a bit together, and they'd always say, oh yeah, find out where those girls are. They're gonna be in the room with the, with the fridge for the beer. <laughs> One time we went up to Edmonton, probably an hour and a half before the rest of the team. So we thought, well, there's no way that George can find us. We can go into the bar and have a few beer before we meet up with the rest of the team. The tray of glasses of beer had just arrived and we we're all yakking away and having a good time and in walks George. It was like, you can't sit us all. <laughs> you don't have enough players. <laughs> Comets dissolved. 69, we became Timex Tires. We found Timex Tire as a sponsorship for the team. So from then on, we had we had meal money. It didn't cost me anything to fly all over Canada and down in the States during those years because he was very, very generous and uh, he sponsored our team for, for quite a few years. And the ascendancy of the, the Timex Tire team, ladies ball became really competitive. I really liked the enthusiasm in the ball, in the, in the dugouts of these women. They'd sing and they'd chant and they'd, oh, I loved it. They loved the spotlight more than the men, actually. I mean, fans would actually really get a kick out of that. But they were footloose and fancy free and they enjoyed putting on a show. In 69 to 71, we were, you know, went to Western Canada Finals. 69, we went to the Summer Halifax Games, which we won a silver medal and those were the first summer games. Here you are going and you're playing in front of 10,000 people. <laughs> you know, whoa. But it was, a, it was totally, totally amazing. Good ball. There I had myself a no-hitter, no which is, you know, that's a big thing, especially in a tournament or in a final like that. And the best coach I thought we had was Joan French. She was the best coach ever. I mean, anybody would agree to you with that. She was an unbelievable coach. You either committed yourself to Joan as a ball player, as a teammate, or you sat on the bench. She was very hard-nosed. She'd come nose-to-nose with any umpire in any game over any call. Oh my God, was that woman intense. When she came out to you, you had to realize she's coming out because she's, she's real. She's not coming out here to mess with you. She gave back to the sport for over 50 years of her life. She's been inducted into the Alberta Softball Hall of Fame as an athlete, a builder, and a coach. And then also as well, she's in Canada's Softball Hall of Fame.
I miss the playing. When I first retired, I found it really hard to go to the ballpark and just sit on a bench. So it probably took me half a year, half a season or longer before I would go to the ballpark. I thought, oh, I miss this. <laughs> The ladies out there nowadays, are, I hope they get the friendship and the leadership and the confidence that I got out of my sport when I was playing it at the top level that I could. It was, uh, it was just such a good time in my life. I just really enjoyed it. 1997, we were inducted at the Hall of Fame at the annual general meeting. It was like walking into a room of all your friends that you'd seen a week ago. The friends and people that you meet, that becomes part of your life. It's always extremely important to make sure that women's accomplishments and what women have achieved in sport and how they have achieved that and what they've had to do to achieve that is made known. You don't do it to create a legacy, but if you love it and you're really into it and without realizing it, you are building a legacy. These girls, they didn't know that. But I think and I hope maybe they, the women who did it, can say, we did well. <laughs>